Algo que veníamos comentando con prudencia es hoy tapa de los principales diarios del mundo. Eh, la catástrofe alimentaria que viene con unas espiguitas de trigo es la última tapa de la revista The Economist. En el orden del, del día figura, por supuesto, el efecto drástico de la invasión rusa a Ucrania en los precios de la energía, la seguridad alimentaria y las cadenas de suministro. Con la portada de esta semana de The Economist, súper impactante, pues haciendo alusión a toda esta destrucción planetaria que estamos haciendo nosotros como humanidad. Buenos días, Raúl. Exactamente, ¿no? Con el titular, la catástrofe alimentaria que se avecina, The Economist uh, publica esta imagen, ¿no? Donde vemos eh, espigas de trigo, donde los granos son, de hecho, calaveras. Alguno de ellos me dijo, el cálculo que hacemos es que entre los 12 meses o 18 meses que vienen, el mundo va a soportar la mayor hambruna de su historia. Y uno de los ejes principales de la reunión del Foro de Davos de 2022. Dos aspectos particulares se han discutido en el día de hoy. El primero relacionado con la crisis energética y el segundo con la crisis alimentaria que está provocando este conflicto. Aplicando el típico modelo de acción, reacción y solución, han creado un problema gravísimo en la cadena de suministros, hasta llegar al punto de dañar seriamente la oferta global de alimentos. Los conflictos sociales comenzaron a aparecer alrededor del mundo, tal como prevía el libro de Klaus Schwab sobre el gran reinicio. En los próximos meses es difícil imaginar el alcance que tendrá esta crisis. La solución que ofrecerán será, y marquen mis palabras, la implementación de un modelo de gobernanza mundial sobre la producción, distribución y consumo de los alimentos. Las cartas las muestran desde la Fundación Rockefeller, donde su presidente, Rajib Sa, se expresó pidiendo que Estados Unidos tome la iniciativa para abordar una crisis alimentaria masiva e inmediata que afecta a muchos países en desarrollo. A continuación, pidió por el financiamiento total del Programa Mundial de Alimentos de las Naciones Unidas. Ante la crisis humanitaria global, producto de la invasión rusa a Ucrania, ya se refirió a la necesidad de impulsar al programa de la Fundación Rockefeller Estrategia de Buena Alimentación, en la que invertirá 105 millones de dólares para apoyar un cambio en el gasto público y privado hacia alimentos que sean nutritivos, regeneren el medio ambiente y creen una economía equitativa. Crean de esta forma enormes mercados cautivos, cartelizando la producción, monopolizándola en algunos casos, pero siempre favoreciendo a los socios estratégicos de la Asociación Público y Privada Tecnocrática Mundial. El broche de oro es que la estrategia de buena alimentación incluye inversiones en métricas que midan la huella ambiental de la producción de alimentos y también cambiará el menú de las grandes instituciones hacia alimentos que beneficien a las personas y al planeta. Seguramente alimentos sintéticos patentados por personas como Bill Gates. Antes de comenzar, los invito a suscribirse, dar like y compartir el material para que llegue a más personas. Como ya es público y notorio, YouTube no permite la monetización de este canal, por lo que dependo de sus aportes voluntarios para poder continuar produciendo el contenido que tanto valoran. Como siempre pueden encontrar los links para hacer sus aportes en la descripción de este video y del canal. Dicho todo esto, soy Nicolás Martínez Laje y esto es Terapia Liberal. Vamos con la intro. Quien controla el suministro de alimentos, controla a la gente. Quien controla la energía, puede controlar continentes enteros. 
Quien controla el dinero puede controlar el mundo, decía Henry Kissinger. Como explicamos en el documental del Club de Roma, la creación de un enemigo común, la supuesta crisis climática de carácter antropogénico, representó un notable éxito en la opinión pública y un gran empuje a la agenda de establecimiento de un nuevo orden mundial basado en el establecimiento de un sistema de gobernanza global. Ambos temas explicados en sendos videos anteriores. El dogma climático puso su atención hace años en la producción de los alimentos, responsabilizándola por un tercio de las emisiones globales de carbono y dentro de ese tercio a la propia cadena de suministros de la industria alimenticia como el elemento apuntado a controlar. Y el conjunto de medidas tomadas en razón de la crisis de 2020 Cierre de los mercados, corte de la división del trabajo, subsidios para desincentivar el trabajo, mandatos de... ya saben qué, han tenido consecuencias económicas devastadoras que llevan a tres objetivos expuestos en la agenda. El primero y el más conocido es resetear la economía, rompiendo la globalización tal como la conocemos. El segundo, romper la globalización, cortar la división del trabajo e interrumpir el mercado, desarrolla, por supuesto, en menor actividad económica. Y esta menor actividad económica es vista como una oportunidad para forzar la transición energética hacia las energías renovables. Como ya hemos visto en otro video, menor consumo energético equivale a menor actividad económica. Y una menor actividad económica nos lleva a una disminución de la tasa de natalidad, o también podemos decir de otra forma, un alza en la tasa de mortalidad. Y por último, muy importante, lograr, yo presumo a través de un evento catalizador, que la sociedad consienta el establecimiento de un gobierno global, de un sistema de gobernanza global, que llevará adjunto el sistema de crédito social. We're developing through technology, an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's, where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So, individual carbon footprint tracker. Hmm. Stay tuned, we don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. También la implementación de las CBDCs And I think we didn't talk about yet, there are two ways on central bank digital currencies. One is the more the wholesale piece. So basically, our interactions as a commercial bank with the, with, the, with the central bank. And here, I would say, it makes a lot of sense. This is new technology coming in. We can talk about it, advantage, disadvantage, but at the end, it's an efficiency game and maybe it's a security game, makes a lot of sense. A completely different ball game it is when you start to talk about the retail you know, central bank uh, 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 digital uh, currency, not because it's digital. I, I, I can pay this digital with my mobile, It has nothing to do with central bank digital currency. But I think the fundamental change is the underlying business model is as I, as a retail customer, as a citizen, will have an account with the central bank. I don't have just an account with a commercial bank. I have it with the central bank which has a lot of advantages for me. It's safe, it feels good. But uh, yeah, there are some challenges uh, with this because the central bank is ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a public office. Uh, the commercial banks are under a commercial regime. Central banks are not under a commercial regime. What about interest rates on an account like that? When things are going well, how does this look like? Oh, on a bank run, how does this look like? Is this accelerating the bank run because I have a safe account with somebody? So. These are then the fundamental question. That's why I think it's excellent to see that 90%, 87%, I think, uh, central banks are, are looking into that and mm -hmm. try, and uh, we need to figure out how that all can work. But having said what is ongoing, I think we are now, what, for 10 years, 15 years in that new toilet technology, blockchain. We see now the, whoop, the market is collapsing. Okay, uh, let's see in five or 10 years, something will survive. Todo ello combinado con pasaportes e identidades digitales. I think at its highest level, I would think of it as the seamless merging of our digital and physical worlds. 
And I think actually currently in the conversation across media and publicly, we, it seems to me a little limited because it seems to center just in virtual reality. But when that actually happens, a seamless integration of your digital and physical world. Just would uh, like to highlight uh, what you said about the European uh, Chips Act because uh, it's an important step to create the physical brain for digitalization and to have it located to a certain extent in Europe. ¿Cuál será ese evento catalizador? La verdad es que lo desconocemos, pero viendo la literatura, los informes que produce esta gente, puede ser desde un conflicto armado a escala global, puede ser un evento de ciberseguridad. 2020 the year that has really changed the world. It is thanks to technology that we are able to join the cyber polygon entirely remotely. Puede ser una crisis de hambruna o inclusive nuevas pestes. This war is really a turning point of history and it will reshape our political and our economic landscape in the coming years. But we also are at the tail end of the most serious health catastrophe of the last hundred years, COVID-19, and we have to reinforce our resilience against a new virus possibly or other risks which we have on the global agenda. We also have to address urgently the issue of climate change and all the other issues Related to the preservation of nature. La realidad es que no lo sabemos, pues son situaciones que se manejan a puertas cerradas. Pero sí, lo que podemos hacer es ir siguiendo el rastro del dinero, de las noticias, de los informes que publica esta gente, esta autoproclamada élite. Que realmente lamento cómo hemos naturalizado que existe una élite, cuando realmente no la hay. Pero lo que sí es cierto que el modus operandi de esta gente, como hemos mostrado también en otros videos, es que siempre han conducido simulacros de todas estas variantes. Lo que nadie había descubierto, y es exclusivo de la investigación de terapia liberal, gracias a los aportes de los suscriptores a través de Patreon, Paypal, Mercado Pago, a través de todos los sistemas de colaboración, criptomonedas, es que efectivamente habían conducido simulacros de crisis alimentaria, algo que se le pasó por alto a todos los analistas de esta cuestión. Como lo describiría la propia Bloomberg, estas simulaciones representaron los verdaderos juegos del hambre. Pocos conocen que existe una suerte de foro de Davos, pero de alimentos. Es llamado la iniciativa el foro IT, que se define como la plataforma global basada en la ciencia para la transformación del sistema alimentario. IT es una startup global sin fines de lucro, dedicada a transformar nuestro sistema alimentario global a través de ciencia sólida, disrupción impaciente y asociaciones novedosas. IT está confundado por Welcome Trust, una organización frecuentemente apodada como la Bill y Melinda Gates Foundation de la Big Pharma en el Reino Unido, vinculada a Glaxo, a la familia Rothschild. Muy interesante las investigaciones de ADN que han hecho Welcome Trust junto a la familia Rothschild, lo dejaremos para otro capítulo. Y como siempre a la omnipresente Fundación Rockefeller. Y como para despejar alguna duda, asociada a Chatham House, al Instituto Real de Asuntos Internacionales. Como trataremos en otro video, Chatham House es la precursora del CFR, precursor de Bilderberg, de la Comisión Trilateral, de la Fundación Rockefeller, de todos estos think tanks que hemos venido mencionando y estamos empezando a armar las piezas del puzzle, pero será tema de otro video. La mayor iniciativa del foro IT se llama FRESH, cuyo objetivo es transformar el sistema alimentario en su conjunto. Los socios del proyecto en esta empresa incluyen a Bayer, Cargill, Singenta, Unilever y Google. En 2015, Cargill, 
junto al Centro para el Progreso Americano, un think tank del Partido Demócrata, vinculado a la Fundación Rockefeller, a la Open Society de Soros, a la Fundación Ford y a muchísimos más de estos organismos que están detrás de la Agenda 2030, junto a la WWF, el World Wildlife Fund, esponsoreado también, como no podía ser de otra forma, por la Fundación Rockefeller, llevaron adelante una simulación titulada Food Chain Reaction Game. Around the globe, food prices have risen about 40% in the last year. The severe drought in the Horn of Africa has reached famine conditions. Violence breaks out in Somalia as demonstrators protesting rising food prices clash with police. We are facing a humanitarian problem. Dice el abstracto del informe del simulacro. El Center for American Progress, World Wildlife Fund, Cargill, Mars y CNA desarrollaron y ejecutaron un juego de toma de decisiones sobre políticas diseñado para explorar los problemas que surgen y las posibles respuestas a las interrupciones del sistema alimentario mundial. El juego tuvo su lugar en noviembre de 2015 en Washington, e incluyó a altos funcionarios y expertos en la materia en equipos que representaban a Brasil, África continental, China, la Unión Europea, India, los Estados Unidos, instituciones multilaterales y empresas e inversores privados. Durante cuatro rondas del juego, que abarcaron la década de 2020 a 2030, los jugadores enfrentaron la presión del sistema alimentario en la intersección del crecimiento de la población, la urbanización, el clima severo y el malestar social. En respuesta, los jugadores diseñaron políticas, tomaron decisiones y realizaron acciones que influyeron dinámicamente en el estado del mundo a medida que avanzaba el juego. A medida que se hizo evidente la reacción en cadena de los impactos vinculados a sus elecciones, los jugadores experimentaron de primera mano cómo sus decisiones y acciones influyeron en la seguridad alimentaria mundial. Esta gente descubrió los efectos de la planificación central durante la simulación, digamos, ¿no? Hubieran leído a Hayek antes o cualquier autor liberal. Al final del juego, los jugadores destacaron las importantes lecciones aprendidas y expresaron una mayor preocupación para abordar de forma colaborativa la seguridad alimentaria. Good evening. It's November 8th, 2020, and this is Dan Cronkite with your nightly news. With food prices rising around the world, tonight, a look at our increasingly vulnerable food system. Food is getting more expensive. Forecasts indicate that prices will soon exceed one and a half times long-term averages. In parts of Asia in particular, the costs of rice and soybeans are rising at a concerning rate. This trend is raising alarms among some experts about the well-being of millions of people and the stability of entire nations. Warning signs about the fragility of our global food supply have been mounting. Back in 2010, the United Nations predicted that in order to feed a population of more than 9 billion people by mid-century, Agricultural production will need to increase as much as 70%. Developing nations, in particular, will feel pressure to double their output. There have been some successes. Since the early 1990s, the world has seen a decrease in undernourished people. Today, 
the world's hungry are mostly clustered in fast-growing developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. But the rising costs of food and the deepening impact of climate change and extreme weather events is creating a growing concern about worldwide availability. But this is not just a concern for the world's poor. The changing climate is also impacting food production in traditional bread baskets, such as the United States, Canada, Brazil, and Australia. And monsoons that enable farm production from India to Indonesia are becoming less reliable. By 2030, 60% of the world's population is projected to live in cities, leaving fewer farmers to feed the growing population. There is a risk that population growth will outpace agricultural production in some areas. In the past decade, we've seen mounting challenges to governments, international organizations, and the private sector in providing access to affordable food. Pressure from a shrinking rural labor force, limited availability of new farmland, increased urbanization, social and political unrest, and climate change-induced risks have led to global food supply disruptions. The stakes are clear. How will our leaders in government, business, and international aid react to this growing food security challenge? The world is looking to them for answers. Fíjense un detalle. Esta es la descripción de Wikipedia de la crisis de alimentos de 2022. La crisis alimentaria mundial iniciada en 2022 es el producto de un rápido aumento en el precio de los alimentos y en la escasez de suministros de alimentos en todo el mundo. Diferentes causas geopolíticas, económicas y naturales se combinaron para agravar los impactos y consecuencias de las crisis. Los impactos del cambio climático olas de calor, inundaciones y sequías, en diferentes partes del mundo se sumaron a la crisis económica y de seguridad alimentaria provocada por la sopa china y la invasión Rusia a Ucrania. Es decir, que la simulación de Food Chain Reaction solamente no menciona un conflicto bélico, pero por lo demás ha acertado absolutamente todo, inclusive hasta las fechas donde transcurriría. ¿No? La simulación se basa en problemas económicos, climáticos, sanitarios, políticos. Es decir, un nivel de exactitud admirable, como ya estamos acostumbrados a ver desde este espacio, denunciando los movimientos de la élite. O son Nostradamus o están empujando una agenda y testeando los resultados para estar preparados para cuando llegue el momento. There are significant risks as we look at the problems we face with regard to food security, especially going forward. Some of the most complicated and some of the most extraordinary challenges that the world has faced in all of its history. Food chain reaction is an effort to put some of the major actors on this planet who have to deal with a global food crisis. Food chain reaction was really to create these scenarios based on scenarios that have happened in the past, but how do countries respond to them? We had eight teams. We had four rounds spanning from 2020 to 2030. Our real hope was that we would get really great participants in the room, which we did, players from all around the world to elevate a more global conversation among all of those different worldwide experts. The game itself created an opportunity to live into the future. It caused people to think through what the possibilities are. And in that process, I think they realized what they have to start to do today to prepare for that future. We began the decade in 2020. Food prices in 2020 and 2021 are climbing. The world in 2020 is a world with increasing pressures from urbanization. It's a world where it's getting hotter and it's getting drier. We're also seeing increased social unrest because of the volatility in the food system. All of those factors coming together, creating that perfect storm. Food security is an issue that affects all of us. If you eat, then you're a stakeholder in how people feed the world. The challenges and crises that we were assigned are exactly what we expect to see in the future. So you've got famine, you've got increased pests, 
you've got the role of climate change in the world. As we face food shortages, it can cause major political unrest. We need to be prepared to address these challenges. There'll be huge pressure to focus more domestically, but I think collectively as the United States, if we diminish our support for overseas activities, that will be a tremendous signal to the rest of the world to similarly reduce their contributions. We could send someone over to the Africa room and try to negotiate some at least soft targets on climate smart agriculture. Africa is the future breadbasket of the world. It has the potential, but it hasn't fulfilled that potential. We would like to discuss opportunities to promote private sector investments. And we would like your support in identifying how we can leverage private investments into the sector to grow it. In the first round, we saw the players in a goal-setting mode, and they weren't necessarily being really active in their implementation of some of the things that they thought might be able to address a food insecure world. The problem is getting worse, the actions are remaining static. That's as bad as you can get. The world doesn't change just by saying good ideas. You have to move forward and actually do things, not just talk about them. Things turn worse in 2023. Stress continues to mount in the global food system. Round two was where we really put the heat on players. That's when we really saw them get action-oriented. Food prices are going up 400%. We've got a flood of migrants coming in. The world is starting to fall apart. In the short term, we give countries in sub-Saharan Africa a large gift of fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizers will severely affect the soil quality in the long term. Will we rather avoid new wars or large-scale starvation to save three years or four years of ecosystem services? There are no good choices in the situation they put us at. Everything we do is going to have some negative effect. A lot of teams started during the first round looking at their own countries. But the situation got so dire that they were forced into bilateral and even trilateral negotiations and meetings. We created a new global coalition on agricultural technology. We got every party who joined it to agree to double their research and development budget. And we were able to get all the other major parties to agree to a price on carbon and then to immediately start moving towards trading. As the momentum's build up, there's more of a sense of countries stepping up to support other countries. If that could be the new normal, it would really be a game changer. Scientists report that 2028 and 2029 are two of the hottest years on record, and they serve as reminders of the degrading impact of higher temperatures on food production. The game designers threw a very difficult scenario at us in the last round with multiple crashes and disturbances all over the world. We organized an impromptu global summit trying to deal with those kinds of crises, recognizing that they were only going to get worse. The point of this meeting is to discuss whether or not we can come up with a response to the growing frequency of climate-driven crises around the world. We are going to have a pretty hard world to live in. So I propose an organization for response to disaster and emergency relief. There might be the possibility of the formation of peacekeeping-like forces. The United Nations could articulate some common standards for things such as logistics planning, for communications, so that when these forces come together in crises, the ability to interoperate has already been predetermined. The final consequence of the game was to bring together all the countries and all the multilateral institutions and really establish a new environment of global governance. The world needs stronger cooperation to meet the challenges that the future will throw at it. Over the last couple days, we learned that alone we can't do it, but together we have all the confidence that this is a problem that we can solve. International cooperation on these kinds of issues is much more possible than people might think. There is a wide diversity of opinions in all countries. And therefore, there are always like-minded people with whom you can start the conversation. I have learned how difficult it is to really think out of the box, to imagine something really new. It is so easy to fall back to the old recipes, to be innovative. It wasn't that easy as I saw. I think I've learned about institutional inertia. How much of a crisis do we need to unlock some of that inertia so that people say, that's not going to work anymore. We have to try something radically different. The new normal is volatility. The end of the game indicated a world with 
greater swings that are closer together that require attention on a more regular basis. The world at the end of this game looks pretty dire, but now we can look backwards from 2030 to today, and we can look at that 15-year time span that lies ahead of us and figure out strategies of getting an early start and addressing these issues. The world can get it right. The simulation showed us that we really need to get ahead of the curve. Keep working on these ideas and expanding them. Talk about this exercise and the lessons you learned from it. I hope this is the beginning of a great global food security network focused on solving the most important security challenge in the years ahead. Una y otra vez surgen los ejemplos de estas simulaciones, ejercicios, que como expresa el autor Ian Davis, de quien ya hemos hablado tanto, parecen más armados para condicionar la respuesta futura de los funcionarios, Young Global Leaders en ejercicio del poder, recordemos, que para ser modelos efectivos de la realidad. Esto no hay que olvidarlo nunca. Toda esta simulación que prevía casi un evento apocalíptico únicamente se produjo por el efecto de la regulación de los planificadores centrales. En forma natural es, era muy improbable que ocurriera. Como dato de color, la web oficial de la simulación de Food Chain Reaction, que es foodchainreaction.org, fue borrado su contenido. El dominio todavía sigue activo, pero el contenido de la página web fue bajado. Nada, nada de lo que está ocurriendo es producto del orden espontáneo. Cada vez está más claro que hay un esfuerzo coordinado en marcha para impulsar una reestructuración global, el llamado coloquialmente Great Reset, que entre otras cosas obligará a las personas a depender de fuentes de alimentos sintéticas y patentadas. No, I've been pleased that the interest level in climate has gone up pretty dramatically over the last two or three years. It was about 10 years ago I had some professors come to me four or five times a year and bring other experts so I could learn, okay, how good are the models? What are the negative effects? What is the uncertainty? What are the positive feedback cycles? And so I've been on this learning curve and that's The whole reason I started this nuclear power company called TerraPower was not to make money, uh, and I've avoided that. Uh, 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 but although the artificial meat companies I put yes. money into, I'm going to make me. more from those than I lost in the other ones. But uh, we're a company that's organized around taking animal protein out of the food chain. We're looking at replacing animal protein where you can uh, with plant protein uh, in a way that is cost effective for consumers, so they can have a very clean protein at a price that they can afford. A meat analog is a term that um, industry uses to describe a product that's meant to be a substitute for meat. We, however, at Beyond Meat, think of ourselves a little bit differently. Uh, our sensory experience is not just a substitute, it's a perfect substitute in every way. So what's so special about Beyond Meat is it has a very similar nutritional profile compared to regular animal protein or chicken in our case and also has the texture and performance of, of real chicken. I mean, for me, that's one of the most uh, fun part about our job is, is going and, and meeting with food critics and, and chefs and, and trying to trick them. Probably the most satisfying uh, adventure in that area was working with Mark Pittman in the New York Times. 
We went to his place in New York and sat down with about seven different dishes. And one was made with, with meat and one was made with our plant-based products. I think two or three he had a lot of difficulty telling us the difference. And I think he reported that as uh, they fooled me badly. I believe the reason that the founders, all of us, you know, founded this company, the reason we work here in this startup, in this office, the way that we do, uh, is because we really care about something other than just purely financial gain. I think everyone's here because in some way or another, this is their life's work. A las que probablemente se accederán a través de un programa de crédito social conjuntamente a renta básicas universales y las infames CBDCs. Elementos que están siendo experimentados en este mismo momento en muchísimos lugares del mundo. Todo bajo la falsa bandera de salvar al planeta y que lo hacen por nuestro bien. Sin lugar a dudas, como muestra una imagen circulando por las redes sociales en los últimos días, el CO2 que quieren eliminar somos vos y yo. Bueno, muchas gracias por llegar hasta acá. Si quieren colaborar con el canal, les dejo los links en la descripción. Y como siempre, los invito a suscribirse, a compartir y darle like al material, si es de su agrado, para que llegue a más personas la verdad de lo que está ocurriendo. Soy Nicolás Martínez Laje y esto es Terapia Liberal. Nos vemos en una próxima y nueva edición. Como siempre, los leo en los comentarios. Muchas gracias por estar ahí.